Hello again, Eric Zimmer here, and welcome back to the history of the British royal family. Where we last left off, King Charles I was executed and the monarchy was abolished for the first and fortunately only time in British history. But now we're about to learn the story of how it was uh, reinstated, restored to its former glory, and other things. So this will be interesting. You ready? All right, let's begin. Chapter 11, The Stuarts, Part 2, A Not-So-Merry Monarchy. The English Republic was ruled by Parliament, which was dominated by Puritans. Strict believers, they sought to purify the country from sin and the effectiveness and the excessiveness of remaining Roman Catholic practices. Adultery meant a death sentence. Well, it is against the Bible, but still. If a man killed his rival in a duel, he could be charged with murder. Puritans made special targets of swearing, gambling, and drunkenness. They closed public houses on Sundays and fast days. Swearing was punished by fines. The amount depended on who had done the cursing. A duke was fined 30 shillings, a baron 20 shillings, a country squire 10 shillings, and everyone else 3 shillings and 4 pence. My god. And that was only for the first crime. All fines were doubled the second time around. Who the hell would pay a fine just for swearing? Of course, some places are more family-oriented, but still. Puritans were always on the lookout for wickedness and opportunities of, for same. This was why the playhouses, dens of vice and immorality, were closed. Traditional pastimes such as bear-baiting and cock-fighting were stopped. So was lewd and heathen maypole dancing. Dyed clothing of any kind was out. It was against the law to be caught wearing lace, ribbons, or decorative buttons. Puritans frowned on long hair, too. England and its people had a very dismal time while old Puritans ruled. But the Puritans made a big mistake when they abolished the monarchy. You see, the monarchy and love of the monarchy were deeply ingrained in English tradition. There is a certain magic about the monarchy, and that's why it remains today. People missed it so much that in 1657, Parliament made an unusual offer. They invited Oliver Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell, now Lord Protector, to become king. He laughed off the very idea. Cromwell knew the people did not want any old king. They wanted the real thing. And that meant Prince Charles, son of King Charles I, who was in exile. Beyond this, Puritanism had a serious weakness. It depended on Cromwell, and Cromwell alone. Once he died in 1658, their regime fell apart. Cromwell's successor as Lord Protector was his son Richard. Richard Cromwell was not the man his father had been. During the twenty months he was in charge, England sank into anarchy. One of the worst aspects was that many soldiers went unpaid. They began to wander around England, stealing food, money, and anything else they needed. Richard Cromwell was so useless that he was given the name, the nickname, Idle Dick. He knew he was out of his debt, so he bolted. On May 16th, 1659, Cromwell disappeared from London. He fled to Paris, then Italy. He even took a false name, John Clark. He, his wife never saw him again. With idle Dick gone, there was no one to rule England. It was now imperative that the king return. Charles had to wait eleven. Charles had waited eleven years to get his throne back. He had made one attempt to seize it by force in 1651, 
but it failed. After Charles's army was defeated at the Battle of Worcester on October 14th, Charles had to go on the run. Oliver Cromwell published a poster offering £1,000 for his capture. Charles was forced to hide in an oak tree to escape his pursuers. Today, the many English pubs called Royal Oak are reminders of this incident. After his defeat in 1651, Charles disguised himself. He blackened his face and donned a shabby old suit of clothes. Although from what I've read, it was difficult for him to disguise himself since he was six foot two. We're just saying something considering he was the son of very short parents. <laughs> After skipping from town to town, with Cromwell's men in hot pursuit, he managed to sail back to France. But nine years later, Charles's great moment arrived at last. Jet Earl Monk, a senior officer in the army, invited him to return as king. On May 29, 1660, Charles's 30th birthday, he entered London in triumph. Londoners turned out by the thousands to welcome him. John Evelyn, the diarist, wrote, The triumph of above twenty thousand horses and foot brandishing their swords and shouting with inexpressible joy. The ways were strewed with flowers, the bells ringing, the strings hung with tapestry, fountains ran with wine, trumpets, music and myriads of people flocking. So they were seven hours in passing the city of London, even from two in the afternoon till nine at night. That night there were fireworks and illumination over the River Thames. Spectators crowded into boats and barges. There were so many, Evelyn wrote, you could have walked across the river. King, King Charles had his own way of celebrating his return. Nine months later, on February 15, 1661, Barbara Villiers, one of his many mistresses, gave birth to a daughter. Known as Anne Palmer, she was one of the king's 15 illegitimate children. Taking mistresses was almost the only entertainment Charles had while in exile. He was not fuzzy about his choices. Any curvy, good-looking woman who caught his eye was invited to share the royal bed. The most humble and the most delightful was Nell Gwynne. She came from the slums of London's East End. Her first job was hawking fish around the richer parts of London, so she was spotted by one Madame Rose, a brothel keeper. So at only twelve or thirteen, Nell became a prostitute. But she was no ordinary prostitute. Nell Gwynne was a lively and amusing charmer. Later, Samuel Pepys, the diarist, called her Pretty Witty Nell, and it suited her. She was ambitious, too. She did not intend to remain just another disposable girl in a brothel. London's stage gave her the chance to move in. The playhouses reopened after King Charles's return. They showed new, sexy, restoration comedies. These rude, crude, suggestive plays made Puritans rigid with disapproval. But King Charles loved them. He was often among the audience at one of the newest, the King's House, which opened in 1663. There he first saw Nell Gwynne. She sold oranges to members of the audience. The charming Nell was eyed appreciatively by almost every man within range. She was an accomplished flirt and took several lovers. One was an actor, Charles Hart. He realized Nell would make her a splendid actress. Would make a splendid actress. At this time, actresses were quite new to the English stage. Previously, female roles had been played by males. Another actress was Molly Davis, one of King Charles's mistresses. Molly hated Nell Gwynne, and Nell hated her back. To get revenge on Molly, she played a wicked trick. One night early in 1668, Molly was about to sleep with King Charles. A few hours earlier, Nellie invited Molly to eat some sweetmeats she had prepared. Molly did not know that the sweetmeats contained a hefty dose of the laxative jalap. That night, the jalap went to work. Molly was seized by violent attacks of diarrhea. There was no lovemaking. What the king thought is not known, but he was probably amused by the joke. 
and the delightful young woman who had played it. Soon he had added Nelly to his roster of mistresses. Another prank, though this one considerably more dramatic, that appealed to Charles' sense of fun was an attempt in 1671 to steal the crown jewels from the Tower of London. The would-be thief was Colonel Thomas Blood, son of an Irish blacksmith. Blood had led a vivid life. In 1670, he kidnapped the Duke of Ormond, Armande, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Blood was sentenced to death and was about to be hanged at Tyburn in London when a last-minute reprieve arrived. Blood fled. A reward of £1,000 was offered for his capture, but he was not caught and set out to steal the, the crown jewels. Colonel Blood disguised himself as a parson. He spent time getting friendly with Talbot Edwards, master of the jewel house at the tower. Their friendship went so far that the two men agreed to a marriage between members of their families. The marriage was to have taken place at the tower on May 9th, 1671. That day, the two accomplices, Blood, arrived at the tower. Um, that day, with two accomplices, Blood arrived at the tower. Talbot Edwards suspected nothing until Blood produced a mallet from beneath his cassock and began to beat him over the head. Edwards fell unconscious to the floor. Blood seized the king's crown and used the mallet to flatten it so it would fit into the pocket of his cassock. One of his accomplices seized the orb and hid it inside his breeches. Meanwhile, the other gang member tried to file the scepter in half. Just then, Edwards' son, Wythe, arrived unexpectedly. When he found his father lying on the floor bleeding, he raised an alarm. At this, Blood and his accomplices fled. But they were caught before they got away. When King Charles was told what had happened, he was so amused, he gave Blood a pardon. He also gave him a large pension of 500 pounds a year and invited him to come to court. It was all part of the fun and games that returned to England when Charles, the Merry Monarch, came back as king. But the Merry Monarch's reign was not all fun. <laughs> there was a vicious campaign of re revenge against the men who had signed his father's death warrant. Ten of these king kill killers were hung, drawn, and quartered at Tyburn in London on October 20th, 1660. One... A soldier sat up while he was being drawn and hit his executioner. But King Charles had other scores to settle. His main purpose in life was never to go on his travels again. He would do anything to keep hold of the throne he had waited for so long. The most important item was to get rid of Parliament. Kings had always relied on Parliament for money. If Parliament did not like a king's policy, they would refuse to pay up. The solution was for Charles to obtain his own store of cash. In 1670, he signed the Treaty of Dover with King Louis XIV of France. Parliament was supposed to believe that with this treaty, Charles would help Louis with his wars in Europe. But there was a secret clause. Louis agreed to give Charles large sums of money. When Parliament became suspicious, Charles lied, declaring there were no secret clauses. But his hands trembled as he spoke. All the same, Louis's money gave Charles what he wanted. He was able to dissolve Parliament in 1681. He ruled without it for the rest of his life. This killed two birds with one stone. Parliament could no longer blackmail the king by refusing him money. But they also could not stop his heir, his brother James, Duke of York, from succeeding to the throne. James was a Roman Catholic. When he became king, he sought to return England to the Catholic Church. This caused an uproar in Parliament. Several attempts were made to exclude James from the succession. None succeeded. James's most powerful backer was King Charles himself. James was the rightful heir, so he argued. Thus, James must be king. but anti-Charles conspirators were also at work. In 1678, two jokers, Titus Oates and Israel Tong, decided to stir things up. They hatched 
the puppish plot. The plot was all hot air. It never existed. But people were so nervous that many believed it was true. The plotters were Catholic Jesuit priests who planned to kill King Charles. This would make sure Catholic James became king. Then the puppish plot became known to a London magistrate. He looked into it and came to the conclusion that it was all lies. All the same, Titus Oates went on trial for perjury and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Next, in 1683, a group of conspirators hatched another plan, the Rye House Plot. This time, they really meant to kill. Their targets were not only James, but King Charles as well. That, they thought, would eradicate the risk of having a Catholic king on the throne of England. One of the conspirators was James, Duke of Monmouth, King Charles' first legit illegitimate son. He was vain, stupid, and ambitious. Monmouth wanted to be king himself and thought that this was the way to do it. The plot focused on Rye House Farm at Hottiston, Hertfordshire. King Charles, a keen race-goer, was a regular visitor to the Newmarket races. A narrow lane near Rye House was on the route to Newmarket from London. When King Charles and his brother James used it to return from the races, the plotters intended to ambush and kill them. But things did not work out as planned. A fire broke out at Newmarket while Charles and James were there. Racing was abandoned. This meant they left Newmarket and rode along the lane much earlier than expected. That, of course, saved their lives. The conspirators were arrested. One, the Earl of Essex, committed suicide before his trial. But three others were found guilty of treason. But they were, there were suspicions that much of the evidence had been made up and that some of the prosecution witnesses had lied. All the same, the conspirators were beheaded. Except Monmouth. King Charles was too fond of him to punish him. Two years later, on February 5th, 1685, Charles died. Just as he had always wanted, James became King James II. But soon hereafter, Monmouth tried again to seize the throne. He headed an armed rebellion against the new king. Monmouth's army was overwhelmingly defeated at the Battle of Sedgemoor in Somerset on July 6th, 1685. He managed to escape from the battlefield and went on the run. Monmouth was found a week later hiding in a ditch. He was accused of treason and executed on July 15th. But Axeman Jack Ketch was a bungler. He chopped away at Monmouth's neck five times. Even then he did not kill him. Monmouth's body was still twitching. Ugh. Ketch threw down, threw down the axe in disgust. I cannot do it, he said. My heart fails me. In the end, a knife was used to hack off Monmouth's head. Even though he had fought hard to make sure James succeeded him, King Charles knew exactly what would happen when he did. He predicted that James would ruin himself within three years. His calculation was perfect. James lost no time returning England to the Catholic faith. Protestants seethed as he gave Catholics important government and other official posts. They gritted their teeth in rage as James opened negotiations with the Pope to return the English church to his jurisdiction. The only comfort James's opponents had lay with his two daughters, Mary and Anne. Both were Protestants. Mary was married to the prominent to the prominent Dutch Protestant, William of Orange. So even if they had to put up with the Catholic James for now, he would be succeeded in time by a Protestant reigning queen. Maybe two. And then in 1688, something happened that changed the whole picture. On June 10th, 
King James's second wife, Mary of Modena, gave birth to a son, James Edward, after 15 years of marriage. James Edward's birth, after such a long time, surprised everyone, even his parents. It also placed James II's enemies on alert. James Edward was now the heir was now heir to his father's throne. That meant an endless line of Catholic monarchs on the throne of England. It was too much. James had to go. A group of seven prominent Englishmen sent a secret message to William of Orange. They asked him to bring an army to England and throw James out. It was a desperate move. Undoubtedly, these men were committing treason. But no one was going to accuse them of that when England had to be saved from the Catholic menace. William of Orange landed at Torbay, Devon, on November 5, 1688. As he advanced towards London, James's army retreated. During the retreat, they began to desert. James knew he was on a losing streak. He became terrified. He thought he was going to be beheaded as had been his father, King Charles I. James tried to escape. He attempted to cross the English Channel to France on December 11, 1688. Though disguised as a woman, he was recognized by fishermen who took him back to England. William and Parliament did not want James back. They would have preferred it if he had escaped into exile. James was given every chance to try again. He managed to get to France on his second attempt, Christmas Day in 1688. Now nothing stood between James's daughter Mary and the throne, except that her husband William did not want to be a mere consort. He wanted to be king. It was King William or no William, he told Parliament. Otherwise, he threatened to return home and let the English stew. Ho, 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 ho. Parliament had to agree, even though Mary was the true heir to the throne. Parliament could not sidestep her, so the throne was offered jointly to William and Mary. They became King William III and Queen Mary II. It was the first and only time England had two monarchs at the same time. Parliament's offer was not without strings, however. They added it. They had had more than enough of monarchs who ranted on about the divine rights of kings and did as they pleased. In 1689, Parliament solved this problem by creating a constitutional monarchy, meaning that monarchs lost some of their rights, such as to make war or raise taxes. The only income they could have was that granted by Parliament. The polite way of describing constitutional monarchy was that the monarch reigned but did not rule. What it really meant was that Parliament fixed the monarchy so it could no longer rock the boat. The first order of business for William and Mary was to get rid of ex-King James once and for all. In 1690, James brought an army to Ireland, but William easily defeated him at the Battle of the Boyne on July 1st. James fled back to France. He never tried to invade again. In 1689, the Scots had tried to fight for him. They rebelled against the new king and queen. They were defeated, and the English were very suspicious of them. The Scottish clans were ordered to declare victory to William and Mary. The deadline was New Year's Day, 1692. But a terrible misunderstanding occurred, and because of it, a shocking slaughter took place. Scots never forgave King William for the massacre of Glencoe, but William's problems were getting worse. He had no children, and there was no hope of any children after Queen Mary died of smallpox in 1694. William was heartbroken. Outwardly, he was something of a cold fish, but he collapsed in tears when told Mary had smallpox. The shock was so great that William became paralyzed for a time. William refused to marry again. This meant that Mary's sister Anne became his heir. Unlike Mary, Anne had given birth to many children, seventeen in all. But something was terribly wrong with each of them. All died while still young. The last, William, Duke of Gloucester, survived longer than the others. But in 1700, when he was eleven, William died too. He suffered from water on the brain and was weak, slow, and stupid. But as long as he lived, 
He was the last hope of the Protestant Stuart monarchy. Two years later, on February 21st, 1702, William III was riding in Richmond Park near London when his horse stumbled on a molehole. At first, William's doctors thought he the only damage was a broken collarbone. But the accident was much more serious than that. William's hand became swollen. He could not sign documents and instead had...